Hello everyone, welcome to session four of LTech 620. In this week's video, we're going to focus on Critical Reflection 3 and introduce the concept of working with grids. But before we do that, I want to introduce you to the First Things First Manifesto. The First Things First Manifesto was written in 1964 by a graphic designer named Ken Garland and 20 other designers, photographers, and students of design. It was written to push back on the use of design as a profession and as a skill set to sell things, to advertise, which the authors called fast-paced and trivial. Instead, the authors wanted to focus their design skills on education and public service, tasks they deemed promoted the betterment of society. Now, in 2020, the manifesto was updated, calling for a massive change in what and how designers design. This updated manifesto and the original are political and social documents, and ones that we don't really have the time to go into detail here. But I wanted you to be aware of this larger conversation that's been occurring within the design profession for decades. And if you'd like to read more, you can certainly check out the 2020 manifesto at firstthingsfirst2020.org. Okay, let's focus on critical reflection three and the Aikido takedown flyer. I want to connect what we've done here with Kahlo's three dimensions of image analysis, the effective, compositional, and critical. Of course, for critical reflection three, we were focused on the compositional dimension and how the elements of the flyer work together or don't to create meaning that ideally is clear and easy to recognize. Now, we could have just as easily analyzed this flyer from an affective perspective. In other words, how did the flyer make us feel? What emotions did it evoke in us as individual viewers? Or alternatively, we could have analyzed the flyer from a critical perspective, thinking about who is represented in the flyer. For example, there doesn't seem to be any women. Is that fair? Should there be? And what does it say that there aren't any women? And what other assumptions and or power dynamics are present in that particular flyer? But of course, all of that is beyond what we can cover in a six-week summer course on visual design. So for now, we're focused on the compositional dimension of analyzing this existing flyer. And what we've learned along the way is that good design involves learning the principles of design, recognizing when they're not being used, and applying those principles. The Aikido takedown assignment, of course, demonstrated that it's one thing to be able to recognize when the principles are not being used, but it's quite another to actually begin to apply those principles of good design in a meaningful way. Being able to do that, of course, comes with practice and iteration, a theme many of you picked up on in the Sansone reading. So let's take a look at the original flyer. And what did we notice? Well, some of you noticed right off the bat the poor craftsmanship. There were obvious imperfections, which I've highlighted here. And these imperfections, of course, detract from both the aesthetic value and the informational value of the flyer. In addition, in your reflections, you pointed out many other ways that the flyer did not adhere to the principles of design. Some of you noticed that the picture was not centered horizontally in the left column. Others noticed that the two columns of the entire flyer were uneven in their width, which disrupted the overall balance of the design. Speaking of balance, many of you noticed that the narrow right-hand column had a lot more information than the wider left-hand column. This really threw off the visual weight of the design. Others of you pointed out the problems with text, such as it being too crowded, misaligned, and inconsistent in terms of font size, style, and effect. Together, all of these problems left a lot of room for improvement. Now, one of the most important tools we can use to help us actualize the principles of design is to use a grid. In design, a grid is simply a structure, usually two-dimensional, that's made up of vertical and sometimes horizontal lines. The result is a grid which can be used to structure content. The purpose of a grid is to establish a set of guidelines for how the elements of a composition should be positioned within the confines of the canvas. Now, sometimes you'll just see vertical lines, which is known as a column grid, and other times you'll see vertical and horizontal lines, which is often referred to as a modular grid. 
So what are the benefits of using a grid? Well, a grid can help you keep your content organized. As a designer, it can make your job easier and quicker because the grid help, helps you line things up and lay out the different elements evenly and with intention. And when we start thinking about typography, having a grid can really be helpful in thinking about the size and position of your type in the overall design's hierarchy. And then finally, using a grid can really help you balance your design so that it is proportional and has balanced visual weight, if that's the effect you're going for. One of the things that we can see just by laying a modular grid on top of the original Aikido flyer is that the right-hand side of the flyer seems a lot heavier than the left-hand side. The left-hand side really only has three pieces of information, the title, the picture, and then the description of Aikido. Whereas the right-hand side actually has quite a few different pieces, and it's really jam-packed with lots of semantic information inside, and all of that is text. Now, I want to show you what we can do with a grid system. So what we have here is an 8 by 11 grid populated with squares. And you can think of the space between the squares as gutters. And then, of course, we have rows and columns. You can think of each of those squares as individual modules. Now, what we can do with a grid system is we can combine those discrete modules to create larger modules. We could think of these as spatial zones within our design. And so here's an example where we have created five different spatial zones, keeping to the two column format of the original Aikido flyer design. Of course, there are other ways that we could mix and match these spatial zones. This is a little hard to see, but if I plot the grid system on top of the Aikido design flyer, this is where you can really begin to sense that part of the problem with this flyer is that there was no obvious spatial zones. And as many of you pointed out, the spatial layout felt haphazard and uneven and it lacked balance. Now, once you become familiar with the idea of grids, you can really learn to see them in lots of different design contexts. Essentially, anytime something is being designed, there's typically an underlying grid system at work. For example, here's a screenshot of the New York Times from a few years ago. One of the things we can do is superimpose a column grid right on top of this design. And of course, I can go through and highlight how the designers of the New York Times partitioned out the content. The headlines of their stories fit into these different spatial zones. And of course, some of the more important content actually takes up two columns rather than a single column. And we can see that the title of the newspaper, the New York Times, is taking up three column widths, suggesting more emphasis or more importance. Here's an example of a magazine. Using a grid system, we can begin to deconstruct how the designers of this magazine composed this particular article. Now, another trick that at least one of you mentioned in your critical reflection was the rule of thirds. I'm sure many of you have run across this concept before. The rule of thirds is often introduced in the context of photography and cinematography. So what is it? Well, the rule of thirds is simply a technique of composition in which a medium is divided into thirds. The idea is to create these critical points where you can position the primary elements of your design. The way you create the rule of thirds is simple. Just divide your medium into thirds, both vertically and horizontally. Here's an example of a famous photograph. One of the reasons this picture is so famous is how well the primary elements of the image, the two fighters, fall into the critical points of the rule of thirds grid. Now, of course, we can apply the rule of thirds to the original Aikido flyer. And when we do that, we can see it doesn't really adhere at all to the rule of thirds. Now, another way of thinking about composition has to do with something called induced structure. This is from a fairly old text called Art and Visual Perception. The idea here is that every canvas has what Arnheim called a structural skeleton. And in his book, he wrote, there are more things in the field of vision than those that strike the retinas of the eyes. Examples of induced structure are not infrequent. Arnheim came to this conclusion by experimenting with the location of a disk or a circle bouncing around within a square. He argued that within the square of the canvas, the positioning of that disk was impacted by what he called invisible fields. 
The idea is that every canvas has this kind of network of forces running through it. So what I've done here is overlaid Arnheim's system of induced structure onto the Aikido flyer. And as you can see here, the pink lines represent visual forces and the direction of those forces, whereas the circles represent areas of attraction. In other words, you might want to use those areas of attraction to put important pieces of information into your design. Because the shape of the canvas, the lines, and those invisible forces tend to draw the viewer's eyes to those specific locations. Okay, I really want to compliment all of you on the great work you did in redesigning the Aikido Flyer. I can see many of you are making progress in terms of understanding the principles and being able to put them into practice within your own design work. That's excellent. And before we look at specific examples, I want to encourage each of you to think about how the rule of thirds in Arnheim's induced structure system might reveal things about your designs. Feel free to try out those systems as a way of finding opportunities to strengthen your own design work. Okay, so let's take a look at some of your designs. Several of you used square or rounded rectangles to organize important information, call it out, and create a sense of balance within your designs. Other designs relied heavily on using simple lines as a way to break up the canvas and group important information. At times, this even created the feeling of repetition within the flyer. Another approach was to draw on strong angular lines to establish a layout and break up the design. What was interesting about these angled lines was how closely they mirrored the angles of the bodies of the Aikido practitioners. I thought this was a clever way to introduce layout and hierarchy to the overall design. Now, both Jessica and Dalen saw an opportunity to use a belt from a karate gi as a visual element that was topically relevant, but served as a means of introducing visual variety and providing underlying structure to the information that needed to be conveyed. In Jessica's design on the left, there is a clear top and bottom half divided by the belt. And on Dalen's design on the right, he used the two ends of the belt to frame some center-aligned text in the middle of the canvas. Now, Melissa worked to create a very deliberate style with her design, making reference to anime and pop art. When compared to the original design, we can ask ourselves how these design choices changed the affective experience viewers might have when viewing the flyers. Which one looks more fun? Which one is more inviting and enticing to look at? Now, Hannah submitted several iterations of the same design, which I appreciated. And as you can see, all three versions have the same overall structure and information, but she decided to iterate on how to present the information about the classes. And she spent a lot of time playing around with the proximity, location, and form of that particular subset of the flyer's information. And so you can take a look at the three different examples that she came up with. Now, finally, I want to highlight a few interesting examples from past students. Here are two works where students used a person holding a sword. They are interesting because the designers created a sense of direction with the placement of the man with the sword. Essentially, if we overlay some arrows here, we can see that the sword is guiding the viewer's eyes to the upper left-hand corner or the starting point of either the Z pattern or the F pattern of viewing. In the end, the large header text in the flyer is being reinforced subtly by the direction of the man holding the sword. I think these were two very interesting examples of working with implied direction, subtly hinting to the viewer, start here. Here are two more examples. And what I want to point out about both of these is how well Arnheim's induced structure overlays onto these designs. Notice how perfectly they match up. You can see here the designers really took advantage of the induced structure inherent in the canvas. They played around in meaningful ways with direction and angle. And the end result, of course, are really powerful compositions.
So where are we going with all of this? Well, our next few steps are going to be to introduce both typography and color. And I'm really excited about these areas. And I know many of you are anxious to have access to those two important parts of visual design work. But before we end, I want to introduce you briefly to the LTEC 620 graphic design rubric. I won't go into this in detail here, as you can read it yourself, but I just want to point out the eight elements that we will be using to analyze and critique various designs we'll be producing moving forward. The very first element, of course, is clarity of message. From there, we get into a number of principles, including contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity. We're also going to focus on two new elements, color and typography. And then finally, the last element is craftsmanship. And this is the idea that we want our design work to be clean, neat, and free of any evident imperfections. Of course, that's easier said than done, but that's part of the kind of intense viewing and precision that we're learning to exercise in this class. Okay, everyone, we're out of time for today. Have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.